girl. But tonight I'm very thrilled and excited to have a very special woman as a guest, Rutania Alda. She's an actor, actress. Do you prefer actress or actor? It doesn't really matter to me. I, I, I started out as an actor and then we became politically correct and we say now actress, but it doesn't. Really, it, it, I, I feel an actor is like a universal thing. Right, it's a yeah. universal thing. To me. Yes, and to me too. Uh, obviously, a writer and author. Uh, we're here to talk about your The Mommy Dearest Diaries. I don't know if we can get a close up, Gloria, but this is what's going on here. Uh, I met Rutania a couple years ago when yes. I went to see a play directed by Roger Simon. Yes, and written by his wife, Sarah Levine Simon. And written Simon. by his wife. Beautiful, beautiful Be play. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Beautiful. And the entire cast was beautiful. All of you. Yes, thank Kate you. Kathleen, she's such a nice woman, too. Sarah I, is just the most gracious, loving soul, I think, I've ever worked with. Yeah, she's yeah. sweet, sweet. But I, that's how we met. And then we have a, like a, we did an interview. Basically, I brought one of my camera people to do an interview, right? On stage. On stage. Uh, that's how we met. That's yes. how we connected. Yes. And they said, I have to have you on the show. That was quite some time ago. And I was keeping my fingers crossed. And I know she's going to come. When she has a time, she will make the time for me. And I'm more than thrilled to have you here. Thank you. I'm wonderful to, be, to see you again and be with you again. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I read this book a couple of times, and Mama is a busy woman, but God knows that I like to do my homework the right way. This is something that, this is such, I mean, everybody knows what Mommy Dearest the, the, right, cult, the, the one the cult. the cult movies of our time or, our, you know, of the last 30 years, really. Yeah, I mean, everybody, yeah. is, this is an iconic yes. film. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it was, when I was reading, basically says, The Mommy Dearest Diaries, Carol Aunt, Carol L, right? Carol Ann. Ann. Tells all. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a journey. Uh, basically, you give us a little synopsis of the beginning and then how you got into the movies, into the acting. But this is a journey that I wanted to read much more. I wanted, when I was reading the pages, when I was making my notes, I said, oh, God, I want to get to know this woman more. I want to know more about her upbringing and her background, your relationship with your mother, with the, your father, the obstacles that you have to overcome. It was quite a few. Yeah, there right? were quite a few. Quite a few. Um, it starts, the first part of the book is my introduction to myself, like right. who was I before I became Carol Ann, because I'm known as Carol Ann in the movie. Right. Uh, and so it's my journey from to America and to New York to study with the great teachers and then the films that I made in the 70s and the 80s. Um, it really ends sort of with the Mommy Dearest thing because then it goes right into the Mommy Dearest Diary and that four month experience and then it ends with an afterward sort of tying up some of the loose ends. So I didn't go too much past that and, and the last, you know, 20 years. But it, it starts with my journey and um, and I think my early journey really shaped the kind of person Woman. that I've become and, and also the humanity in which I, I, I try to live my life because I've seen so much of the dark side and so much of the s sadness and the tragedy because I come from uh, World War II, a ba uh, child of World War II, and the displaced person camps, mm -hmm. which were um, phenomenally um, poor. <laughs> Nobody had anything to eat. I mean, we had black bread and lard for three months in a row. We were happy to get it. Dandelion soup. We were happy to pick it. And, and I mean, it was a very, it was a time of great desperation. I mean, Europe was in ruins. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were, really everybody was uh, struggling. So um, that's sort of how, how my early childhood was formed because I didn't come to America until I was nine. So right. all my early childhood was in the camps. You and wanted was, to go to Australia before, right? I read that you guys yeah, got, we the, got We got accepted in Australia, accepted Australia and America within a day of each other. Uh -huh. And after waiting almost six or seven years, because in that era, you had to be vetted. You had to, um, they had to, you had, they had to know about you, they had to know about your background and your family, and, um, and so it took time. And also my mother was a, a, a woman with two, two small children, and my father was lost, and we did, as it turned out, he was sent to the gulags by Stalin. Uh -huh. So we didn't know for years that he was alive. So for us to come to America, we were not the most desirable family. Right. Um, because mother with two children was not 
on the desirable list. You wanted a working man and family, and mm -hmm. it was that era. It was the 50s. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my mother remarried uh, somebody in the camp. So when she remarried this man, then we became like a family with a head of household, and then we got accepted in Australia and America. So we decided to come to America. That's, what was one of your earliest memories as a child? Going back in time, if you can rewind and just go back. Uh, my earliest memories is on my grandfather's farm um, in Latvia, and it, when the bombing started, because Latvia was in the middle of the war between Germany and Russia. They were mm -hmm. caught back and forth. The three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the three little countries, they were, uh, the Russia wanted the seacoast, Germany wanted the, on the march to Russia. So my earliest memories, what we were playing on a farm with a, a, a pet chicken and a wonderful horse that I used to ride as a very small child. I'm, I'm sure I thought it was riding very fast, but I'm sure it was like my grandfather was kept me safe. And then the bombing happened over the hill and the bombs burst and then my grandfather put us on a wagon with his best horse which was a race horse oh and and, see all this? Uh, and we he incredible. wanted us to get out of that area and go back to the to the city so he thought we'd be safer in the city because the fields became the battleground for both the armies yeah, the sense of fear was something that was present in your life, early age. I think it still is to a point. Still. I think that's my biggest thing that I have to overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you think about it much? I don't think about it as much, but it does happen, and I get I get overwhelmed with fear, and I have to stop and say, okay, let me just go through this. Right. And sometimes it's like it's like not conscious. It's like. It's something that is almost viscerally just my body just goes and <clears throat> and to this day the loud noise is like a boom and a bang. I just you go can, like this. Right. Be, um, and I think it's just in your nervous system from those childhood things. I think it's just in your nervous system that you don't quite ever get over, but you learn to uh, live with it and you learn to live with um, that kind of background and and that kind of deprivation you kind of look back and you think sometimes i just wake up in the morning and i think what do i have to be grateful for i have so much to be grateful for i do my gratitude list and i i think that's the thing to remember that i'm trying to focus on as a person today it's just in gratitude even though sometimes things are very challenging mm -hmm. and life is not easy it's no. not you know nobody ever said it was easy so no. Uh, and, and we have to remember that it's not just me, it's a lot of people have challenges. And, and I think to re that to remember, it's been a life, this is a life journey to get to this point where I say, mm -hmm. okay, you know what, that's not going right and that's not going right, but look at what I have. I've got my health, I've got a nice warm apartment, I have, uh, you know, uh, I have son, a hot shower, have I have career. my wonderful son, I've got a career, I'm, I have, you know, things that in my life, friends now that I'm very grateful for. And so, you know, I have to remember my gratitude list. And that's kind of almost a daily thing that I have to do. I try to do that in the morning and then I try to do that in the evening before I go to sleep. You write it down or you no, just I, say it? I, you know what? Sometimes I do write it down. Sometimes okay. it's the writing of it down is like really important. But in the morning I don't write it out. I just say it out loud. Beautiful. I say, okay. Thank you, God, for this day. I'm up. I'm alive. I'm here. So uh, it's that's quite, sort of it's <laughs> quite a journey, Rutani. I, I was reading your lines, and like I said, I read it twice. I was making notes, stuff that you know that made an impression on me. Your obviously your relationship with your mother was something that I wanted to read much more because you're such a strong woman, and you have to overcome so much to be sitting here, to be living the way you live, to, right? To be able to do your craft, your acting, in the way that you've been doing it for how many years? Quite a few. You've been, yeah, 50 quite, years. Quite a, that's 50 a long years time. Already. It is a long time, half a century. Half a century. <laughs> you know, you go like, my mother was, looking back, it's, it's easier for me now to really forgive her and let right. her go. 
uh, at the time that I was going through, I think my mother was was really destroyed by the war. I think her whole life was destroyed, as she knew it. My 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 father was lost to her. Her country was lost. Her home was lost. Her, she was a woman of a lot of loss, and I don't I don't think she ever recovered from it. And I really thinking back, I think she suffered from mental illness as a result of that because the very cruel things she did to me were were not. Something that people do when they're when they're together. I think she did it out of a lot of her own uh, anger and her own um, cruel. There's a cruel streak that happened to her against me um, that just continued until I had to cut off my relationship with her. Right. In my late twenties, I had to just say, I can't be that target anymore. I can't be that vicious punching person, bag. that punching bag, where she would call me up in the middle of the night and tell me, you're ugly, you're too ugly to be an actress, you should never be an actress. And she would do these horribly cruel things to me. And I finally had to say, because I was in therapy, and I finally had to say, you know, I have to stop this. So I actually changed my phone number to a private number. And then I would get mail from her. And a lot of times I would not read it, I would tear it up. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would read it. I read enough of it, the horrible things, the venomous things she would say to me. And now, you know, it was very hard to deal with at the time because the hardest thing is when you have a parent that you know doesn't love you. Mm -hmm. It can be a horrible thing. You don't, you don't quite find your place in life because you think, God, oh, nobody loves me, you know, and you right. think, Ah, uh, you know, I'm, I must be worthless mm -hmm. because my mother, my own mother, thinks I'm horrible. Mm -hmm. So I must be a worthless, horrible person. That's the big lesson to overcome, and it's really difficult. I still get choked up about oh. it. But um, I'm sorry that I, I have no, to it's bring okay. it up. But it's, no, it's, you know it's, what? You know what? It's life. It's, it's the reality. life. This is it's a powerful journey. You know, it's it's so much. Like to go back to the roots and to go back to square one and, and to see where we come from, it takes courage to look back. Because we, you know, you move, moved on, obviously, you, <laughs> you moved on, but it's something that I can't help, I can't help but to ask you. Because I, I, when I was reading it, I just couldn't believe it. When, how can somebody be so sick? So yeah. sick in the head and so yeah. sick in your soul. It was really right? her own. And you know, it, it's tragic. Her life was really a tragedy because at the end, she was all alone. Uh, I think, you know, she, she just had cut off everybody and, mm -hmm. and, she was, uh, and there was no way to live. But one of the nice things, one of the positive things that came about writing about this is a, a, a person messaged me on Facebook and said, I am so glad you wrote about this about your mother because he said, I went through a similar thing. He said, mm -hmm. I'm 40 years old and I have never talked about it. He said, so you're talking about this right. has, has opened the door for me to talk about it because he said, I thought I was the only one that a parent didn't love. I thought I was the only child that some, uh, and he said, now that you've written about this, I realize that I'm not alone. And that was like, wow. I mean, I thought, Wow, if, if one person, if I reached one person like that, that's, yes. that's huge. I always said it to my friends, you know, when I seen the Schlinder list a few years back, but when I seen it, and at the end, you have that scene with Ben Kingsley and E.M. Neeson, yeah. where he gives him the ring and says, whoever saves one life saves the entire world. That's very powerful. It's very true. It is very true. And... I like to read things that inspire me. Um, and your journey is inspiring because you overcame a hell. It was hell what you've been through before. Going back, growing up, and like I said, facing the obstacles that you faced is something that is not, not a lot of people can do it. Not a lot of people can say, okay, that's all in the past. I moved on. I, you know, I made my life. Yeah. I have my career. I have my son. I have my, it was a lot. It was a lot. And like I said, when I was reading these lines, before we get into the Faye Dunaway and Mommy Dearest and yeah. your acting, I wanted to know so much about you because this is the woman that I'm, 
that I have respect for. It's a lot of movie stars out there that everybody, I guess, we want to know <laughs> stuff that is interesting. Forget about gossip. We like to be entertained to a certain degree, but we like to have that connection, you know, with people who made it through it, and you did. Yes, it's, that's why I'm you really uh, I'm happy about my journey, that I, I think I have become a the person that I wanted to be, um, and that is, um, you know, I look for, um, I think what what this has done is I become a much more compassionate person, right. and I have a lot of compassion for people, and uh, humanity, you humanity. have a lot of humanity yeah. about yourself. And I think and you love that, for animals too. And I love animals too. I think animals are the innocence of the world. And I mean, you look at them; they're really, truly the innocence, and they have unconditional love. And and they're so I don't know. I just my cat is there on my bed this morning, snuggling with me, and I just put my arm around. Him and I said, "This is like he's happy. He's just happy. He's here. He's purring." And yeah. I thought, "I'm happy too. I'm happy that I have this little." person here. Yeah, happiness is in simple things. Very simple things. Very simple yes. things. That's one of the things I've discovered as I've gotten older. It's not the big, huge things. No. Uh, it's, it's the little simple moments of life that we kind of thread together like string of pearls or something. And, and they're the ones that we really build on. I mean, sure, we'll have big things every once in our lives, but that's not that's not the building block. That's not the what we build on. Right. And and even a, a walk, you know, when the leaves are falling. I was noticing the other day in the park, these golden leaves were shimmering and, and before they fell. And I thought, oh, my gosh, isn't this beautiful? It's like <gasps> take in this breath of beauty that's just yeah. all around you. And you just have to kind of notice it yeah. because it is there. We just have to notice it and kind mm. of wake up and say, wow, there's it's so here. much beauty here. It's here right now. And it reminds me of this beautiful yellow sweater, that the beautiful golden leaves. You're it, like a, you're like I a leaf. Like colors, <laughs> I like colors. I love it. I love red and orange. And <laughs> it's being aware, like my father used to say, we have to be aware of God's presence. Yes. That's and right. we forget. We just forget because we get caught up in, right. in whatever we're getting. But don't forget that God is everywhere. God is in the child. God is when you see a bird. God is when you see a rabbit, a dog. When you see, it, it's like God is everywhere. And if we can ad admit it to ourselves and see the beauty, we can find more happiness. But unfortunately, once again, we live in a world that is too cut up. It's too competitive. It's too much. It's too competitive. It's too much. It's, and we were talking about this before the show about this 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 whole frenzy of competition. It's yes. it's so insane. destructive and so insane. And uh, you just have to take a breath back and not get caught up in this 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 craziness. Yeah. Uh, and it's not what we will remember when we toward the end of our lives. I can guarantee you that it's yeah. not that. It's a uh, helpful hand or something human that right. you'll remember that you'll take with you a pet, an image of a pet, your parent, your lover, your whatever. Yes. But it's not this crazy no. thing that, no. you know, we're supposed no. to do in no, life. No, no, no. You have a strong foundation. You see, this is, is, like I said, it's a lot about you that I know a lot of people will be interested. I said, I want to. I want to read more about when she came to America, before she came to America. Like I said, it's a lot more that we want to know about you. And I want to know about the acting when you came to New York, when you decided to be an actor. Tell me the journey, please. Uh, well, I wanted to be an actress since I was like five years old. I was mm -hmm. in the displaced person camps. And two things happened. I saw a play because we didn't have that much to do. But somebody came in and did a play. Uh -huh. And then I got very sick, and I was sent to this sick kids camp in the mountains. And they showed a, a film. I had never seen a movie before. And to me, the play and the movie were both, like, magical. They were people that were living in another kind of a place another for, for a long time. And then the GIs gave me comic books. Roy Rogers was a uh -huh. big one. And I thought America was all cowboys and Indians because the first movie I saw <laughs> was cowboy and Indian movie with turned out excuse me, turned out it was like Gary Cooper. It was a Gary Cooper movie. So 
I just thought it was like wonderful. So it's the 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 seed was planted there. Okay. Then when I came to America, I I I really actually sort of lived in movies. It was like my mother and stepfather were working nights and they would sleep during the day and I didn't have much interaction with them for a while. And I would take my 25 cents and go to a movie, but I would go the whole day. I would see the, that. Was, this is when you could do that. You can't do that now. <laughs> but I'd go at 11 o'clock in the morning. And then at, at 11 o'clock at night, I'd come out and have my little peanut butter sandwich or something. Uh -huh. And I would see the same movie over, over and over again. And that's how, sort of how, how I learned to speak English. And uh, and so movies were, to me were, were really kind of my family. Right. And uh, Your heroes. My, yes. And, right. and, and at that time, you know, you take I remember looking at a movie and I was saying, I like this person, I like what they stand for, I like them, and I would try to embody or, or want that in quality in myself. So it was sort of like a teacher for me. And so when I got to high school, I, I started acting in high school plays, and then uh, the same thing for college, and then as soon as I finished college, I went to New York, and I studied with, like, the best teachers of the time. I know. The Can great, we mention all the great just a teacher. few, because, my God, <laughs> like I said, yeah. once again, you have a lot to tell. Yeah. I studied with Lee Strasberg, Sandy Meisner, Stella Adler, That's Paul so Mann, uh, Barbara Loden. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving somebody out, but all the great teachers of, of that time. Yeah, I, did you I keep with. diaries? Tell me that you did. I Tell did me not you did. keep oh. any diaries. The only diary I ever kept was the Mommy Dearest The Mommy diary. Dearest. He's <laughs> about to ask us right here. I, yeah. I, I have it right here. That's a question. Yeah. You know, it, the reason why you created, what's the reason why you created your own diary with Mommy Dearest? But the acting coaches and the acting experience is like, what do you remember from each teacher? Well, I do, do. I have notes from my classes. Oh, you it's do. Not, it's not like I, I, I have notes on what the teachers said. I have a journals on every one of the teachers. Okay. So I, okay. I do have my acting workshop notebooks. Um, my greatest teacher, I mean, they were all great in There's their own way. something that a lot of actors would love to read. Uh, yeah, you know, that's a possibility of something in the future to do because I do have a lot of, I, do, I did keep notes on what my teacher said and what the specific, specifics were of that teacher's process. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. I, I, I do have that. Um, but I was in that special time in the late 60s and the 70s where, mm -hmm. where all of the... It was such a creative time. People yeah. were, it was, my joy was to be in that, those classes. It was like I thought my education started in the classes. They didn't start in college. I mean, I know I have a degree and everything, but I felt like when I came to my acting teachers, I, I really got a sense of education through the characters, through humanity, through lessons, through because we have to try to be the essence of that person and we have to try to create that person as written and, and, and we have to aspire to that to that to that largeness, that bigness, to that right. to that scope. Because those are legends. There and and so that that was my ed, what I, my education really started in New York with my acting teachers. Yeah, and, reading and about each all these names: Strasberg, Stella Adler. These are big names. Yes. Any actor anywhere, any actor anywhere, recognize those names. Yeah. You know, it's it's quite a. They were great teachers, all of them, in their yes. own way. They were great. My greatest teacher to me was Barbara Loden. She was married to Eli Kazan, Kazan at the time, and I became friends with the whole family. But she was an incredible actress. She got. Um, uh, she was in a play with Arthur Miller about Marilyn Monroe, and okay. she played the character, so she was like the it girl of, of for a while, the great actress for a while. And then things happened to Barbara, too, that, um, you know, I, I think her talent was never fully re recognized. But, but it happens a lot, right? Yeah, it happened. But she was like my favorite actor. She made a great movie called Wanda, which she directed and starred in and wrote. I haven't it, seen and it. And it's sort of... It's sort of being revived again and recognized by people. Um, Isabella Huppert in Fer Paris did a whole thing on that movie. Oh, really? Uh, but she was great in this movie. I, I cannot recall. Yeah, yeah she's a wonderful actress. So, uh, wonderful. but I'm glad that some people. The movie's kind of being 
a recognized, and she was the first woman director that really did a, a, a film at that time. This mm -hmm. was in the 60s. So. What can you say about Leah Strasberg that we don't, that maybe we don't know because there's a lot of myth about the man. Well, Lee, Lee was, what do you uh, tell I became, me? well, I, I started dating Lee because I he's know. very interested in me. I was saying, oh my God, this is something that I was kind of, ooh, wait a second, now it's getting a little juicy. So you dated I dated Lee and Lee fell in love with me and Lee asked me to marry him. Uh, but at I, this restaurant, at, at the Sardis, Sardis. Uh -huh. yes, at Sardis I remember restaurant. that over escargot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which I'd never had before. I was having it for the first time, and that I don't think I've had since, by the way. Uh, and Lee was, um, I was just too young. I was in my t early twenties. He was already around sixty. We were, I mean. I really, I, I think I, I, I didn't handle it well, let's put it that way. I, I, it frightened me. I, 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 I thought he just really liked me and right. he liked my acting, he liked me as a person. And I didn't realize that he had fallen in love with me. So, so I, I ran away and I refused to talk to him, mm -hmm. which is not the way I would handle it today. Right. But that's how I handle it. So I didn't handle it in the right way. Uh -huh. Um, and I kind of regret it. Having said that, he wound up, I think the next year, the following year, marrying Anna Strasberg, who was like probably the perfect person for him in his life mm -hmm. because he stayed married to her until the end of his life. Right. So, I mean, it was probably, in the long run, it was best for him, but it was best him. for me. But uh, it was, um, he was, he was doing that time in my life when I dated Lee. He was very good to me. He, he was, was like, good. and looking back, I think that I, he was more of a father figure to me, not have, having had a father. Mm -hmm. I loved him as a father figure and as a teacher, but I was too young to get married and, and I wasn't ready to, to have a relationship. I was, I was, I didn't know who I was. Why do you think actors have this obsession with Lee Strasberg? Besides the method, obviously he's a myth, but what do you think in your I, eyes? I think it's the same thing that I was attracted to. I think he, he was like this father figure, this, this family father figure who was very wise and, and he, you thought, well, you know, he really knows me, he really understands me. Uh, so it is that kind of attraction that he had for people. People were really bonded to him because he represented that loss, I think. I think not only did I not have a father in my early life, but I think a lot of actors that go into the business don't have a good relationship, don't have a father or mother or oh, something. Lord. I think we, we all come, most of us come from some wounded place in our lives and we feel safe with a, portraying another person in another in a story because we know the outcome mm -hmm. we know the beginning and the middle where in our lives it's not that safe we don't we're not that safe right and i think with lee people felt safe and he was a great father figure the wise person the person that knew more than you did and i think a lot of people were which were the children, and uh, and and he was the, the 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 master. I mean, that's how I sort of remember the classes too. People were in awe of Lee, and and they they uh, mm -hmm. they 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 had that that connection with him, mm -hmm. and so that's sort of my theory of it. I mean, somebody else could have another theory, but that mm -hmm. was sort of my, that was my take on it, too, looking back at my life, was that I thought Lee was just wonderful, and he was so great to me, and he would take me out to dinner, he'd take me to shows, I'd go over to his apartment, um, and he was, he treated me like family. Right. And so, uh, a family that I didn't have. 
And then, of course, with him it went further. But with me, I was just I was just too young and too too uh, I didn't have enough life experience to really handle it. So how the lucky way and blessed to be such a wonderful teacher. Yes, yes, I, I really, really. Was, I mean, this is something that I'm I'm dying to read about all the notes. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Notes that you have with yes. Lee Strasberg, you have is Stella Adler as well? Yes, I have Stella as too. What do you have to say about Stella Adler? What's your impression? What's your gut feeling about her? Stella was, uh, the best thing about Stella for me was her script analysis work, script uh -huh, analysis class. Right. She had the best script analysis of any teacher I, I had. And in fact, she would do plays solely sometimes with just her talking and breaking the, the script down into, um, but the interesting thing is like when she did Death of a Salesman, she broke down the class. But she always did all the men. She never did Linda. She never did the women. I thought, isn't this interesting that she did the men? She was a powerful woman. Right. But I thought I wanted to know more about the character of Linda in Death of a Salesman because the wife can, it's a very tricky part to play. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never played it, but I, it I thought it, it's a tricky part, mm -hmm. but Stella never analyzed <laughs> Linda, but she would analyze every, everybody else beautifully. She just was absolutely... And she was passionate. She was... Passionate, smart. She was like a queen. When, you, when she walked in, she looked at you like you were, you were, <laughs> she, you uh -huh. were her little peasants. Uh -huh. uh, but she was, she was the queen, and she was, she was Stella. She knew who she was. It's, no, you, don't, you didn't no, come God. up against Stella. But she was very smart. I mean, she came Extremely. from a theatrical family. Her father was a huge, right. uh, a huge star in the Yiddish, in theater. The Yiddish theater. So she grew up in that. And her, her, her brother, Luther Adler, was a great, uh, a great actor. And so, I mean, she was a smart woman. She was yeah. brilliant, really. And Brando really was obsessed with her. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes, he was. And there's a documentary that I don't know if you've seen it in Showtime. I seen it last on Saturday. Uh, Listen to me, Brando. I did see that. Yeah, what do I you did think? see that. You liked it? I, I, you know, I liked it. I, I liked it, although I think part of me thought, well, Marlon was so manipulative in so many ways. I wonder if he manipulated this whole <laughs> thing, too. He was so smart. She, she, you know, obviously recognized Marlon's talent, and she mentored him, really. She mentored him. She got her ex-husband, Harold Clurman, to use him in a mm -hmm. play that started his career, and she mentored him. She really, she, of all people, I think, is the biggest responsibility for his career. Yeah, also, that's what she, he says. Yeah, also, books. he studied with her for several years, and if you study with Stella for several years, you're going to have a good foundation. I mean, but she obviously saw the talent in him mm -hmm. to, you know, obviously he was talented. But having all, the, so let's talk about how you're breaking films. How, how, how did it happen? You say, oh, I'm going to go to L.A. I'm going to start making movies. Let's talk about that, the whole experience. When well, my first journey casted. was to go to New York as opposed to L.A. because I wanted to be with real to, actors. I, I wanted to be with real actors and I wanted to, have really good teachers. Right. So I knew what I was doing. Um, my movie career actually started in New York with extra work. Right. Um, I did my first job was with in a Sandy Dennis film called Up the Down Staircase, where I played a high school student for about three weeks. Um, I didn't have a speaking part. I was like in the background walking. And then I I, I did. Uh, I did stuff like that, and I, I photo doubled for Barbara Streisand and Hello Dolly with yes, Gene I Kelly read about that. I for read about, about that. six weeks, and then I photo doubled for Mia Farrow in Rosemary's Baby, Baby. with Roman Polanski, and then I got my first break, and Bar Brian De Palma was just starting out; nobody knew who he was, yeah. and Robert De Niro was just starting out; nobody knew who he was, right. and we all wound up in the early Bar Incredible. Brian De Palma film called Greetings. Greetings. i seen it a long time ago. I will have to sit down and watch it. It's the ultimate 60s movie, by the way. It, it really is like, a, this is like, a six, and Brian started out in 